Hi, my name is Maureen and I'm Director of Interfaith Scotland and um, welcome to all of you who've joined us today for this Facebook, uh, face, Facebook Live series on the climate crisis. Um, we have decided that this climate crisis series is, has got the title Beyond. Um, last month we did the climate crisis beyond politics. Today we're going to do the climate crisis beyond religion. Next month, on the 21st of April, we're doing the climate crisis beyond science. And in looking at this beyond series, what we're really trying to say is that the climate crisis, what we're all facing, is actually beyond anything that humanity has ever faced. And that we need to come together, as A, as a human race, but um, in, a, in a way also the whole, all the diverse elements of society need to come together. So whether it's religion or politics, or science or economics, education, that we need to bring all our resources together and really work together to tackle this immense challenge. Um, Interface Scotland has actually made this year the year of climate action, and we hope that the action we take as an interface organisation will make a difference. We'll be sharing our faith-based climate resources on our website actually tomorrow, it goes live tomorrow, so pre please really do look out for them. Today, we have three distinguished speakers on our panel. The Right Reverend Dr. Martin Fair, moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, Lindsay Taylor from the Muslim Council of Scotland and Chair of Interface Scotland, and Fraser Sutherland, Chief Executive of Humanism Scotland. Each speaker will share thoughts with us for 10 minutes and then there will be a time for Q&A. Some questions have already been sent to us and hopefully there'll be additional questions come via the chat function. So let me introduce the first panellist, the Right Reverend Dr Martin Fair. Martin was born and raised in Glasgow. He's married to Elaine and has three grown up sons. He's been the minister of St Andrew's Church Arbroath since January 1992 and is currently the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. I first got to know Martin through his work on the Scottish Religious Leaders Forum and you can see Martin sharing the forum's statement of commitment on the climate crisis on our YouTube channel. Ma Martin has a passion for justice, fairness and ministry, um, ministry on the margins and enjoys mountain walking, all sport, cinema and reading. Martin, welcome. And we really look forward very much to hearing what you have to say to us today about the climate crisis beyond religion. So beyond your usual. <laughs> All right, welcome, Martin. Thank you Martin, for your welcome. And let me just say at the outset, delighted to be sharing this uh, panel with uh, Lindsay and Fraser. Um, I'm always been in the business of building bridges rather than barricades. And I think this word beyond, which is another of those uh, words beginning with B, sums it up so nicely. We've got to be beyond ourselves. Uh, and that's where the metaphor comes in. Let's build bridges because we share this in common rather than barricades between what you think, I think. Let's find the common ground. So I'm delighted to be part of it and, uh, and to share with you now. I want to start off by, by suggesting that we need to reflect on what we mean by the word religion from, from the outset. You say uh, the climate crisis beyond religion. Well, what do we mean by religion? I think maybe folks uh, are persuaded in terms of their understanding by somebody like Doc Cotton, long-standing cast member on EastEnders, uh, who portrayed a certain, under a certain thought of what religion might be. Um, maybe others think it's restricted to those sort of keen, slightly odd folk who like to sing hymns and pray on Sunday mornings. Um, certainly that there is a ritualistic aspect to religious faith. But I'm motivated by and passionate about the scriptural definitions of what religion might be. And I think when we explore those, we get a much better and bigger understanding, which explains, I think, why it makes sense to be talking about climate crisis. We can go into the Old Testaments for Christians, for the Old Testament and to the prophet Micah, who defines religion like this, 
to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. Now look at the first one, to act justly. That's religion every bit as much as singing hymns on Sunday morning. Or in the New Testament epistle of James, he says this, religion that God finds genuine. And he says several things, but he begins with this. Firstly, caring for orphans and widows. In other words, it is about justice. It's about inclusion. It's about caring for the needy and most vulnerable, and so on, so on. Therefore, my ministry as a Christian leader has been defined in those terms. Not so much what happens through the rituals of a Sunday morning, but what is done in the name of that religious organization Monday to Friday. I just give you one example. What has been the key outworking of our faith uh, in my own community, in our broth, has been our Havala project, which has supported a huge number of young men and women to come through addiction, many of them long-standing, um, long-standing heroin addiction and such like. So we're doing that all through the week. This is what we mean when we say that religion is first and foremost about caring for the vulnerable, caring for the most needy, acting justly, not writing people off, uh, not judging people, but accepting people where they are and seeking to love them and support them and so on and so on. I think when you begin to think of religion in those terms, that it's about how we live and how we act and how we serve, then it's not such a big leap as when it's restricted to the ritualistic side, as perhaps people understand it to be by perception, as being something restricted to 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. So my interest in and commitment to climate justice is a working out of my faith commitment and not separate from it. It's part of my religious outworking, if I can put it that way. And an understanding of early chapters of Genesis is really important to me in terms of climate justice and creation care. Especially when I think we read the, word, the, the text properly in Genesis chapter 1 and at verse 26, when we read of, of course, creation and then that men and women are created and given responsibility, responsibility for caring for creation. Now, that's been worded so differently in so many scripture versions through the years. More traditionally, we've read about rule, that human beings will rule over the rest of creation or even reign over the rest of creation, R-E-I-G-N. Now, when you take it in those ways, of course, almost the door is opened to the abuse of the natural world, to, might I put it in such harsh terms, the raping of the natural world for human needs, as if there was this hierarchy and human beings ruled supreme over all of it and could use and abuse the rest of creation as they saw fit. A better understanding of that text is that human beings are stewards over creation and have responsibility for creation. And it's that kind of understanding that fuels my interest in and passion for climate justice, and yes, care for creation. And here's the thing why it's beyond religion, because I am committed to it and delighted to share with all others who share that commitment for, for the environment and for climate justice. In other words, I understand fully that though for me this spills out of my faith commitments, there are others who are equally committed, who come from a different place and from a different motivation. I'm happy to and want to put that aside and say, you know what, we're partners in this. This is what I think we mean by beyond religion. It's not the preserve of one group or another. So yes, it's interfaith, 
that's what that's the forum we're here today but it's beyond faith too conceived of in religious terms so let's build bridges between ourselves that we might partner together in what affects every single one of us over the whole face of the earth let's build bridges and do away with some of the barricades that too often we allow to separate us Maureen, I didn't count the 10 minutes, but I think I'm maybe just all right, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Martin, you were spot on 10 minutes, so thank you very much for that. And um, I mean, of course, it's a fantastic metaphor to build bridges, and that is really what we're hoping from this series, that we will just be able to look at all the amazing bridges that are being built as people work together to tackle this incredible crisis that is facing humanity and that we're part responsible for let's not forget that it's all part and parcel so now it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce our next uh, panelist who's lindsay taylor lindsay is the scottish regional manager for mend it's a muslim engagement and development which is a not-for-profit company that helps to empower and encourage british muslims within local communities to be more actively involved in British media and politics. MEND also works to tackle Islamophobia across the whole of the UK. Um, Aparna, can I check please if Lindsay is on full screen because at the moment I'm seeing Martin <laughs> as I'm introducing Lindsay. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll start again. Lindsay is the Scottish Regional Manager for MEND the Muslim Engagement and Development, which is a not-for-profit company that helps to empower and encourage British Muslims within local communities to be more actively involved in British media and politics. MEND also works to tackle Islamophobia across the UK, in fact, the whole of the UK. Lindsay is a Muslim representative for Interface Scotland um, and took over the role of chair at the last AGM. As a board member also in the Muslim Council of Scotland, this is her second term, and Lindsay is the interfaith lead as well as policy lead for the Muslim Council of Scotland. Lindsay also sits on a range of committees and advisory panels as an individual and representative of both the Muslim Council of Scotland and Interfaith Scotland. She's a graduate of Strathclyde University with an LLB honours in Scots law and an LLM merit in human rights law, and has a background in working in environmental field, where she ran projects in the third sector and for equality organisations. Welcome, Lindsay. Really delighted to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Maureen. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here today and to be on the panel with both Fraser and uh, Martin. And really, really inspirational um, talk there, Martin, about the need to build bridges. And, you know, especially when it comes to religion, um, that's definitely what it's all about in all areas that we build bridges. Now today I really want to look about the role of Islam and environmentalism and why it is beyond religion that we have to look. Now many believe that Islam and Muslims are not overly engaged in the environmental sector and that they maybe don't prioritise um, environmentalism when it comes to a religious practice. But actually um, we are taught that is, um, environmentalism is really important within our practice. Now, as um, Maureen said in my introduction, I have worked within third sector organisations and equality organisations delivering projects um, on environmentalism. And one of those projects, the first one that I oversaw, was one uh, within Al Mazan, which is a Muslim Women and Children's Resource Centre based in Glasgow. And the whole project was focused around environmentalism and where that sits within Islam and where that sits within our religion. You know, Islam has a really rich tradition of highlighting the importance of caring and protecting the environment um, in accordance. Um, basic elements within nature belong to everything and not just to humans. And this is really highlighted to us within the Quran and within the Surah. Um, when we read through the Quran, there are different verses that highlight the importance of connecting with the environment. So we have verses such as in Surat um, Araf, which is verse 85 of the Quran, which says, and do no mischief on the earth after it is set in order. That will be best for you 
if ye have faith. The Quran also explains to us that we are the stewards and the caretakers of the environment and of the planet. This does not mean that we have a right to overuse the resources and that we have a right to use and abuse the earth in any way that we want. Actually being a steward of the earth means that we must protect the earth for future generations and we must protect it in a sustainable manner to make sure that it's there for all of humanity as we move forward um, in our generations. The Quran also tells us to eat and drink, but don't uh, eat in excess or waste in excess, for Allah loves not the wasters. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who obviously we hold so highly in the Islamic uh, world, highlights to us again the absolute importance to protect the environment and to protect it for ourselves and also for future generations, but also for all living creatures in the, in, in the world. So in the Hadith, which is the teachings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, it says, the earth is green and beautiful and Allah has appointed you as stewards over it. And this is highlighted in the Quran as well. He also goes on to say in the Hadith, or sorry, the Hadith go on to say, if a Muslim plants a tree or sows a seed and then a bird or a person or an animal eats from it, it is guaranteed as a charitable gift for him. Highlighting to us, that it's not just our duty to look after the environment for other human beings, but also for all of those within the environment who use it, the animals, the birds, the fish, and so on. And it's really important that we protect it for all. It also says to us, whoever plants a tree and diligently looks after it until maturity and it bears fruit is therefore rewarded. So we can see that Islam from the very beginning has taught us the importance of looking after the, the creations of Allah. From the very beginning has told us that environmentalism is really essential and really needed. And this was way before environmentalism was a popular thing and actually was ever really needed at that time because we did care for our creations. But as we've moved forward, many of us, not just Muslims, but many within all religious faiths and within non-religious faiths, have lost sight of this slightly, the need to protect the environment. We're now seeing this massive need to protect the environment in the way that the world is going at this point. And many people are embracing this and getting on board with environmentalism. Although many people again think that this is a new thing that's only happened in the last few years. But actually I remember as a child and a woman in my forties then that was some time ago. But as a child, my parents were very environmentally driven and they taught us about the importance of looking after the world. I remember going down to the River Kelvin and doing river cleans and making sure that we were doing our bit to protect the environment at all times. And this was in a religious and non-religious way as I was growing up. And this to me is what it is to be beyond religion because it's not just about as a religious individual that we need to embrace environmentalism. We need to embrace environmentalism as human beings, as all human beings coming together to work to protect the environment. We also need to make sure that we are coming together in a really inclusive way, because what we've found quite often is that as env environmentalism has become more popular, that unfortunately often it has had the kind of the thinking behind it or the kind of ethos behind it of it is a very kind of white middle class middle aged pursuit to engage in and often leaving out large sections of society, although this now is beginning to be um, readdressed. But it is important that all aspects of society come together to tackle environmental issues, because it's only when we all work together and as Martin said bridging those gaps it's only when we all work together in a really joined up thinking approach that we will be able to tackle the issues that we're faced with today in this world. And it's only when we come together and we remember that it's not just the global north who have to address the issues, but also the global south, but also the global south who will be more affected or who are most affected by environmentalism. And it's, so therefore it's important for all of us to take onus and responsibility. Now, what I mean by that is quite often in the global north, we think we forget about the global south, we forget about the work that they can do and are doing and live in their everyday lives. We also forget that actually quite often in the global north, it is us who are most affecting environmental um, impacts within the world. 
and that therefore we need to make more of an effort. And it's really important that we do that, but that we include everybody in that journey and everybody in coming together. Islamically, we've been taught that throughout time, that we are the stewards. It is for us to look after the earth, but it's for us to look after the earth for everybody. And it's really important that we come together as everybody to make sure that happens in a really joined up, in a really effective manner. Thank you very much, Maureen, for um, having me to speak today uh, and for giving me the opportunity to highlight the fact that Islamically, we are very engaged in tackling um, environmental issues and we're really engaged in doing this in a really joined up way. Uh, and it's really important for all of us, whether we're religious or non-religious, to come together and tackle environmental issues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, it was lovely to hear you speak and great to hear some perspectives from both the Islamic and the Christian tradition. And I think it's very critical that we have Fraser with us today, because this, after all, is, is very much the climate crisis beyond religion. And I'm delighted to say that Fraser is Chief Executive of Humanist Society Scotland, a position he has held since May 2019. Prior to this, he ran the organisation's communications and campaigns work. Before the Humanist Society, Fraser worked for Citizens Advice Scotland, where he led work advocating for change on behalf of clients who had issues with payday loans and doorstep lending, private rented housing and rural bus services. He co-authored the Scottish Government's Review of Funeral Poverty in 2016. And since 2016, Fraser has been a member of the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland, which advises Scottish ministers on disability access and inclusion in transport. Fraser lives in Falkirk with his wife, daughter, and Jack Russell Terrier. And it's a um, really delight to have you with us, Fraser. So welcome, and we're really looking forward to what you have to share with us. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Maureen, and apologies if the Jack Russell Terrier um, noise comes through the, the, this afternoon. So hopefully she she won't be too loud. But um, I, I think there's a in the before I start, there's probably a couple of um, uh, themes that probably borrow again from both Martin and from Lindsay. Certainly, Lindsay's point I touch on this in a second about the global north. We have a, a particular responsibility, I feel, and how we how we tackle the climate crisis um, and also I think no one can I think disagree with Martin's point on building building bridges and, and, and the importance of that but thank you to Interfaith Scotland for inviting me to come along and to speak from a, a humanist perspective as to why it's important that we take the climate crisis seriously and why I feel there's a morative, uh, a moral imperative uh, for meaningful action. When wildfires, wildfires were sweeping across Australia, one climate scientist, Nirel Abraham from the Australian National University posed the question that we, I think, all need to ask, how much worse are we willing to let this get? This is what global warming of just over one degree Celsius looks like. And do we really want to see the impact of three degrees or more are like? Because that's the, tri the trajectory that we are on. The 17th century French satirist Mollerie once wrote, it is not what we do, but also what we do not do for which we are accountable. And I think for humanists and, and perhaps for us all, this is a statement that sums up entirely what we need to consider when it comes to the climate crisis. Scientists who have studied our climate for decades independently have overwhelmingly agreed consensus that accepts that climate change is real and that it's driven by human activity, most notably land clearance and the burning of fossil fuels. There's also consensus that this change is impacting global weather patterns, the polar regions and represents a substantial threat to unique ecosystems and habitats such as coral reefs and permafrost. For humanists we should be concerned for the obvious reasons that this presents an existential risk to people all over the world. Habitat destruction, the fate of refugees displaced by climate change and the need for aid and support for those who will inevitably be impacted by drought, floods, wildfires. These are only the tip of the iceberg. In 2019, the General Assembly of Humanists International agreed the Reykjavik Declaration on Climate Change Crisis. In it, the humanist organisations from every part of the world said, human beings are part of the natural world. 
but we have a just disproportionate effect on the global environment and biodiversity. Throughout history, our species has used the natural world to increase individual and collective well-being, and the impact that we have is no longer sustainable. Policies adopted by governments need to be informed by scientific findings. Governments need to respect the overwhelming conclusions reached by the international scientific community, including that the overuse of natural resources and the increase in greenhouse gas emissions is driving catastrophic climate change, threatening the diversity of life on Earth and the sustainability of human societies. Indeed, extreme scenarios pose an existential risk to humanity. The world must act with urgency and in a globally coordinated way to reduce and prevent human contributions to climate change and to mitigate the climate impacts and to adapt to them. Sir David Attenborough, on being asked whether there's any hope that things can get better for our planet, said, we can only slow down the rate that things get, um, get worse. And, and here is something and a challenge of the statement for all of us, whatever our faith or our non-religious outlook on life, we need to help avoid a disconnect in the public that just throw up their arms and say, we're all doomed. And adapting to the challenge of the climate crisis, we need to consider some ethical questions, such as those posed by Neil Levy from the Centre for Practical Ethics at Oxford University. He points out, how will we deal with our collective guilt of getting us into this mess in the first place? And perhaps there are some lessons here from how we have approached, or rather, how we've avoided the legacy of human sl slavery. I think we're starting to learn some of those lessons today, but the progress has been painfully slow and not without attempts to derail it. But we need to fall, avoid falling into a fatalism of how can I make any difference when I'm just one person? As Levy says, given that what we do today can make a difference to what happens in 2100 or later, we can and we should fight to slow the rate at which things get worse. Even though we can't realistically hope for improvement, if we're told that humanity would become extinct immediately after our own deaths, but without affecting the quality or duration of our life, we would be devastated and our life would lose meaning. So key to taking this seriously and not dismissing as happens all too often in our media, we need to take seriously young people's genuine fear for their future and for their children's future. To combat the what can I do attitude, we need to think about, encourage individuals to take steps that they can take to reduce their impact on the environment. We need to bring people with us through encouragement of individual actions that can build up collectively to meaningful reduction in, for example, greenhouse gas emissions. We need to also recognise that those of us in more economically developed countries should carry the biggest share of efforts to combat the climate crisis. We have contributed to it most of all, and as such, I believe we have a moral imperative to clean up our own mess. Humanists are people who promote the scientific method. We promote rationality, we promote reason, and we promote a common endeavour to tackle problems. We should therefore be particularly concerned at those who seek to disrupt and misinform the public on climate change. It's my opinion that there's a new creed of denialism, most notably science denialism, that's reaching a new zenith. Denialism is defined as rejecting basic, undisputed, well-supported, well-evidenced facts and supporting outlandish and controversial alternatives. How many of us have perhaps niggered in the past at flat earthers in the last decade? But sadly, our dismissal and attempts to ignore such denialism has only seen it reach into more dangerous areas. COVID-19 denial, anti-vaccination panic, and AIDS denialism have all cost thousands of lives. And I know that everyone involved in interfaith work, for example, has seen the impact of and fought against those who deny the Holocaust and deny the Srebrenica massacre. We cannot allow the same style of denialism to derail discussions and efforts to combat the climate crisis, because it's the same techniques that's being used of claiming a global order conspiracy, of cherry picking information to fit their arguments and the promotion of false experts. This neo-denialism is inflated in reaching new parts of our communities by how easy it is to spread lies and propaganda through social media and streaming services like YouTube. The challenge, of course, is that denialism is like all scams and con artists. You're meant to feel like their ideas are rational and attractive and that it makes sense. 
for me, the theme then of today's discussion on the climate crisis being beyond faith and belief is key to this discussion. We must all in our own communities challenge this dangerous denialism and equip everyone with the ability to spot manufactured science denialism and feel confident in ourselves to reject such irrationality. And I'm just going to finish uh, with a, a short quote from a humanist scientist, Marie Curie, and she said, nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. And I think that sums up our challenge for the climate crisis. Thank you, Fraser. That was um, excellent. All three speakers have really given such um, such interesting uh, points of view, both religious, non-religious, scientific, um, ethical, um, and just covering so many points. And I was thinking about my own faith tradition um, as a Baha'i. One of the things that the founder said was that science and religion should both be quests for the truth. And that if you have science without some sort of ethical understanding or ethical and moral uh, basis, you can have gross materialism. But if you have religion without the balance of science, then you end up with superstition. <laughs> so this wonderful kind of engagement between science and religion does take the conversation beyond just the scientific or just the religious point of view. I think um, there's just so many things that um, we, sh we should be able to explore together. And I'm delighted with some of the questions because they they actually that have already been sent to us because they really resonate with um, with some of the points that you have already made. So I'm going to direct the first question actually uh, to Fraser because you have just spoken on this and I think it's it's quite an interesting point and then I will address it also to Lindsay and to Martin. Um, the question that was asked um, was, has COVID-19 and the pandemic, do you think, shifted the climate crisis as a priority? Do you think it has slipped off the radar because of the pandemic? I think there's certainly a, a danger that obviously with any new priority, then, then the focus is temporarily taken on that. Um, obviously, I think there's an immediate crisis to be dealt with in terms of COVID-19 in terms of saving lives so clearly there's you know it's not wrong that governments have prioritized an action on that I suppose my argument would be it's not either or there's benefits actually in some ways to the way in which we have forced ourselves to change our lives around COVID restrictions a lot more people work from home now there's been a there's been a concerted effort to make that change because we don't want people gathering in workplaces. And where it is, where people are able to do that, I think we should be moving to a system where we're, we're encouraging that rather than encouraging people to travel large distances in cars, get truck stuck in traffic jams every morning on their way to work, because that inevitably just, just fuels um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and stuff like that. We should encourage people obviously to take more exercise. And I think actually the evidence is that people are more likely to be taking walks every day. Um, and hopefully if people get out in their local environments, that makes them feel more impassioned about protecting the environment in, in total. So yes, in the short term, I think it has taken an eye off the ball, but I think the longer term impacts of how our lives have changed because of COVID, I hope will only make it more important more likely to, to challenge climate change. Thank you. And Martin, I'm going to ask the same question to you because of the, your role in the in the Church of Scotland as moderator. Do you feel that COVID has shifted the climate crisis as a priority for you or your community, so the wider, say, Christian community in Scotland? Or you will have to unmute, Martin. <laughs> I had to happen at least once. Let me begin by saying that back in the first lockdown, so probably about April last year, I was out walking my dog early one morning, as I always do, and suddenly it struck me that something was different, and, and I stopped and thought and listened, and eventually I worked out what it was. It was the silence. I was hearing birdsong that I just had not been aware of for so long, and that was because of the lack of traffic on the road. So there's an appreciation there, which I think came through the lockdown. But of course, it, it's, it's not going to be simple to find a balance because, you know, the economy must somehow work. And uh, otherwise, we put so many people uh, out of work. And, uh, and where do we go from there? So it's this sustainable balance. In terms of 
economics, we've been driven in the West all the year, uh, all the years by, by the, the idea of economic growth being essential. And we have to get to the point of seeing that, that we can't grow year on year, economically speaking. So has COVID knocked the climate crisis off the front pages? Well, it has, yes, in the short term, but I think what it has done is actually brought them to prominence in the longer term. And Fraser made the very valid points that how we work, patterns of work are definitely going to change. Patterns of holiday making, cheap flights to Prague and uh, Estonia for two nights, stag nights, all of those things. You know, we've got to look again at, at those kinds of practices. We've got COP26 later this year in Glasgow. So if, if climate crisis was off the front page, it's coming right back and rightly so. Thank you, Martin. And Lindsay, what about yourself? Do you feel that COVID has shifted the climate crisis as a priority, either for you or for your, the wider Muslim community? No, I think I, I would definitely agree with the previous two um, previous two speakers that they've they've highlighted that yes, to begin with, possibly it was knocked off the agenda to begin with, um, or or kind of sidelined slightly, and completely understandably so. But I think it's definitely changed individual people's outlooks on um, on needs, on priorities, on on that kind of thing. I also do think for um, for community wise, it has kind of changed, being that. MCS has definitely taken on this year the need to focus on the climate crisis, especially with COP26 coming to Glasgow. So I do think that it has made a lot of people reevaluate the importance and their priorities of different things, such as, you know, where where is the new workplace going to be and how will travelling to work happen? How will travelling around how the UK and the world happen and things like that? So I do think priorities for all communities and not just the Muslim community have definitely shifted with with the pandemic and in many cases in a really positive way I know that lots of cities have um, introduced a lot of kind of cycleways in cities that were maybe not there before and so on we're definitely hearing a lot of news about that which is great and um, and so yeah I think to begin with, yes, but now it's definitely just reevaluating and, and reshifting people's focus. And even if people don't realise that they are being more environmental in their actions, I think the way that we've had to be has made a lot of us more environmental in our actions. Thank you. Thanks for the three answers. And actually, I think one of the things that the pandemic has highlighted is that um, we're in this as a global humanity. And in our live chat, we've had a really interesting question that I think maybe is at the kernel and the crux of, of some of some of this, particularly looking at beyond, beyond anything that we've ever had to grapple with as humanity. And the question actually comes from Shetland. So, um, you know, a place that, uh, that I have visited many times and I'm very fond of. So Robert from uh, Shetland has written saying, how will we, humanity, create a world order which is capable of making the concerted action absolutely essential to deal with the climate crisis. So it's that sense that individual countries can't just tackle this on their own. How, where and how and what do we do to create a, a global movement or a global um, governance that would allow um, us to truly tackle the climate crisis? So um, Fraser, shall I just go back to you on that one? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no problem. I think um, obviously there's uh, challenges. There's always challenges with international, you know, agreements and stuff like that. We've seen, you know, the United States pulled out of the, the Paris uh, Agreement and climate change. Uh, you know, uh, an agreement that had, you know, far-reaching uh, agreement across different nation states to seriously take uh, action against. Uh, the climate crisis and you know a populist leader was elected in Donald Trump and then he decided to withdraw them and, and they've now reversed that decision with the, the election of their new president. Um, so these agreements can be made and I, I know that you know many people who are involved in environmental work will quite often criticise that they don't go far enough. I would agree with that, I would agree entirely with that. I'm not entirely certain that we need a, a kind of new world order to, 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 to achieve these things. Let's look back at history and things that we have achieved. For example, the ban on CFCs in relation to the, the hole in the ozone layer and, and the, the, the repair, the natural repair of the ozone layer that has, and, and has followed as, 
as part of that. Now, that was con concerted international action across different nation states to agree to the ban of the use of that chemical in refrigeration products, uh, products mainly. And that had a, a viable impact on, on the environment. So if we managed to do that in the 1980s with CFCs, why can't we manage to do it with greenhouse gases in the 21st century? And I think Martin hit this uh, point on the head when he, he talked about this insatiable um, appetite for um, for economic growth all the time. And I think that's something we need to to, to challenge. And, and if we can if we can do that, then I, I think that may be one of our answers. So since you were mentioned there, Martin, I'll, I'll say the question again and just your thoughts on it. That kind of how will humanity create a world order or, or world governance, whatever, which is capable of making the concerted action absolutely essential to deal with the climate crisis? I want to go back firstly to what Lindsay and Fraser both said in their opening statements. They talked about global north and south. And the global north must take responsibility. There's no question about it. It's so, so inherently unfair um, for us to say, for example, to some of the booming economies, China and India and so on, uh, well, you've got to stop. Um, you know, we had 100, 200 years of uh, industrial growth and so on and so on. Um, we used uh, every available resource that was available to us. And now it seems so unfair to say, well, we're going to, uh, we're becoming cleaner. So you, you've got to stop. Well, it, it, it's not as simple as that. And, uh, and then the global north, north must take responsibility. No question about it. I think the other thing I want to say, Maureen, is that it can become um, disheartening sometimes when you think, well, how can I, how can I, how can a few of us impact, you know, change the global, the global order? So I think when we become disheartened or feel, you know, disempowered in that way, let's remember that it always starts with ourselves. So there's no point in saying this politician, that politician, this government, that government, if we ourselves are not taking our own responsibilities. And that does come right down to our individual choices about holidays, about the, the cars we buy if we have a car, about our recycling habits and so on. And um, government will not in itself do anything if we will not do something. So it's this sort of both and I think that we need to campaign, we need to lobby, that's what COP26 is going to give us opportunity to do, but to take personal responsibility as well. Martin, that, that resonates very, very strongly with, with, with all of us, I'm sure, and everyone that's listening. And it's sometimes knowing just what personal responsibility to take. And one of the questions that we had that I'm going to direct to Lindsay is, um, what do you feel is one of the most important things as an individual, that an individual can do to play their part in tackling the climate crisis? Because Martin has mentioned this, that we have to play our part. So what if you had to say, right, this is one thing that I think everybody should and could do, what do you, what would you say that one thing would be? That was a great question. So thank you for, from, uh, I think it was from John. Mm -hmm. Do you know, that that is a really great question. And working in the environmental, um, the environmental sphere and uh, all the kind of projects that I've run and, and things like that I've been asked that question quite a few times like what is the most important action to take and actually it's to take action it's to take action is the most important thing tackling the environmental issue can be exceptionally overwhelming it can feel like where do I start where do I begin like how do I do it do, do I change my soap do I change my water usage to change my car do I you know it can be overwhelming so what I always advise to people is take one action it doesn't matter where you start start somewhere just think about what's an easy action for you is it turning down your thermostat a couple of degrees is it that you're able to change your car and you're in that kind of position to do that is it that you go from using bottled plastic soap you know every day to buying a bar of soap every day, which is maybe more environmental. What's the action that you feel that you can take? 
And before you know it, that becomes normal and you've normalized that action into your routine and then you're ready to take another action and another action and it just builds and snowballs from that. And before you know it, you look back and you realize that your house is full of more environmental products that instead of throwing out things when you're finished with them, you're passing them on, you put them on free cycle, you put them on swap sites, you've done all this kind of, and before you know it, it just becomes a normal part of your everyday life. So it's not about that one particular action that we all need to take and we all need to be taking the same action. It's what fits in your life. Start somewhere because it really is exceptionally overwhelming. I have been an environmentalist most of my life and, and I still find it overwhelming. And I still find myself that I'm doing things and I suddenly think, oh no, like that's not very appropriate and that, that's not the best thing environmentally. So how can I change that? But just starting with that one little action, that's that's all that it takes and you're off and running. Thank you, that sounds like very sound advice. Um, we've, we're, we're getting lots of live questions. We've got one here from Samira. Uh, Mohsen, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Samira. And I think I'm actually looking at, at um, all of us, myself, Lindsay, Martin and Fraser, and this one's directed to young people. So Fraser, I'm going to go with you. I'm guessing you might be the youngest. And the question is, how can we engage our youth in tackling climate crisis? Um, and she, um, Samira saying, I think if they are fully involved in it and make responsible decisions in their lives, it will benefit the, the cause. Schools need to play their part in education um, and really involve serious thinking about the environment and not just around grades and getting jobs. So some really important points there, um, but particularly the question, what, how, would, how do you think um, you know, we can engage or how, how can young people get engaged with this? Um, I, think, you know, I think from my perspective, um, you know, having met younger people in the work that we do with schools and, and with others, I find that, that that young people tend to be the most engaged on, on, on climate change. They tend to be the most uh, scientifically literate of, of people that I meet in my day-to-day -day life and they understand the, the science behind climate change, understand what's happening. Um, so my challenge, I suppose, would be that actually we should utilise the earth, the youth to, to, to educate the rest of the population because I actually feel like they are much more informed um, on the impact of climate, both the impacts of climate change, but also the, the causes of climate change. And there's, you're, you're right when you say about mentioned schools, I think the, the education of, um, um, you know, climatic education or just generally ecosystems and, and, and how the world works is, is very strong in Scottish schools. And, and that gives them a good grounding to understand some of these complex issues because the science behind it can be quite complex it can be quite dry when you start looking at charts with loads of figures um how you then translate that into meaningful action is is difficult um how do you engage young people to make meaningful change um i think you know for me you know one of the worst things that i've seen you know in the last few years is the is the horrible abuse kind of um directed towards uh, Greta Thunberg for, for her actions to, you know, tackling climate change, you know, from from terrible comments about, you know, her and her, you know, what she looks like to, you know, just she can't understand anything because she's just a child and all this kind of thing. You know, how are you ever going to expect to engage young people in, in the importance of this challenge when they're just constantly den denigrated and told they don't know anything, they're too stupid and all the rest of it. Of course, by people who actually have no understanding of the science at all themselves, will quite often put down that. That's what I was trying to, in my opening statement, when I talked about this kind of, this creeping sense of denialism when it comes to science. And, and my worry that, that that kind of takes hold, thankfully I'm not seeing it take hold too much amongst young people, it tends to be. To be, to be older people that get taken in by this kind of science denialism that floats around on social media. So hopefully there's there's hope for the future, but I think we need to, to challenge some of how easy it is to spread on social media, because if we don't, then, then, then more people will be taken in by it. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Fraser. And I think the fact that you've mentioned social media is very powerful because young people are incredibly active on social media, perhaps more so than like, my generation or Martin's generation I mean we're on it we're, we're there but um but I think that there's a, a just a, a very natural engagement with young people and social media and if they can 
be constantly getting the message out there that we all need to care for this planet and we need to take action and even some very practical things about what sort of action could be taken. Um, I think young people will be doing all of us a fantastic service. And it seems that generations before, although sometimes I question that, it says, you know, our generation were the ones that have created this um, situation. And I think back to my childhood when there was no plastic bags, we only had paper bags, you had glass milk bottles, you walked everywhere, family didn't own a car. So sometimes I think, you know, that there's, that um, there are myths spread about the, um, for, you know, what older generations have done. And actually we were incredibly environmentally friendly. However, this is beyond all of that in that we all have to work together and there's something very um, powerful about that. And one of the questions that was asked by Gordon that um, is, I suppose, directed directly to me at Interface Scotland, it says, any practical ideas on how Interface Scotland can contribute or lead efforts to combat the climate crisis? Well, I'm hoping that by this making this year, which we've done, the year of climate action and working with um, faith leaders, Martin's on the Religious Leaders Forum, with local interface groups, with faith communities, with young people, um, and just with government as well, actually. Interface Scotland was on the Social Renewal Advisory Board, um, and really looking at, at all aspects of um, our engagement, how we can have the climate crisis right at the top of our discussions, our dialogue, our discourse, our action. Um, and it's a big, it's a big ask. And I'm going to pass now to Martin to say, how did you find working on the Religious Leaders Forum, for example, and, and pulling together the statement of commitment on the climate crisis? And that was very much an interfaith endeavour and one that, um, that you were very instrumental in helping pull together, Martin. So I thought maybe pass to you. Actually, Maureen, it was a joy to be involved in that and uh, so much more meaningful and powerful, I think, because it was, uh, voiced from all kinds of different um, faith groups. You know, we, for example, Church Scotland, Presbyterian Church here, we could have fired something out in no time at all. But it's, it takes more work. Um, and sometimes you've just got to be patient as people come to an understanding. But when you do something with others, in the end, I think it's of far greater weight and value. And so the statement that we produced as religious leaders, I think, um, you know, bears testament to that. Uh, way more important than if just we ourselves uh, had done that. And this is what I come back to saying how I started off. We need to find partnerships with all kinds of people who are not necessarily uh, like us, who don't necessarily share all our views and, and everything. But here's something that grabs us all, affects us all. And, uh, and let's work together on it. I think we're coming towards the end of this um, Facebook Live event. And I think those words, this is something that affects us all, that grabs us all um, and is central to all of, not just all of us living on the planet right now, not just the human race, but all species and all future generations. It is, as I started out saying, something beyond um, anything we've ever experienced as a human race. Um, I personally, and I'm, I'm guessing that Fraser um, as a humanist and Martin as a Christian and Lindsay as a Muslim will also feel this. I have great faith and hope in humanity's ability to turn this around. It's, um, I think scientists are saying we have to about 10 years to turn this around. Um, and if we're, you know, just, being in a forum with people like yourselves gives me hope, but there's so many different forums that we have been on where I see there's a huge will for humanity to work together in all sorts of different areas. And I totally agree with Fraser that we have to take this beyond rhetoric, beyond religion, beyond everything, and listen to the scientists and know that they're telling us the truth about what's happening to our, to our planet, but use the ethics um, and the moral principles, the justice of, of our humanist and faith traditions, uh, you know, to really say we need to step up. And it's not just about governments doing something that the whole of humanity has to. It's been an absolute pleasure to be with all of you and uh, to be with you, Lindsay, Martin, Fraser. Um, you've been delightful panellists and um, we look forward to further engagement with all of you in the future.
So, and thank you very much to um, all those who sent in questions. There are further questions, but there will be um, further Facebook Live. So just bring your questions to the next Facebook Live. Um, and you, we've got some great um, panelists as well for our event in, on April the 21st. Um, so thank you, thank you for joining us and uh, thank you to our panelists and have a good afternoon. <laughs>